Sanctuary. 
Good morning, I'm Pastor Steve Potate Marshall. Welcome to this worship service for the Atascadero United Methodist Church. We're so glad that you joined us for this video this morning. And if you are signed on to YouTube, we invite you to chat with us as we go through the service. And please register your attendance with us and fill out any prayer requests that you'd like for us to be praying with you for. Uh, also, our online giving format will be posted in the information as well. So again, welcome to worship this Sunday. is from Psalm 116 verses 1 through 2 and 12 through 19. I love you, Lord. How can I not love you when you always respond to my cries? You are always ready to listen to me, so I will bring my needs to you as long as I live. How can I ever repay you, Lord? What gift could ever express my gratitude? I will raise my glass in your honor. I will name you as the one who saved me. I will make good on all I promised you, Lord, and I'll let everyone know it's for you. My name is Sally Dexter Smith. Let us pray. We give you all thanks and praise, O God, for your love has been poured into our hearts through your Holy Spirit given to us. Nothing is too wonderful for you, and with a word you brought all creation to birth. You revealed yourself to our forebears, Abraham and Sarah, and promised them the fruit of their withered dreams. The fulfillment of all your promises came in your child, Jesus, who revealed your compassion for the people, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing the sick and the broken of all that afflicted them. In the fullness of love, he gave his life for us while we were yet lost in our sin. But you raised him from the dead, and now through our faith in him, you justify us and give us access to grace. Therefore, with our hearts lifted high, we offer you thanks and praise at all times 
through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. This is our thankfulness prayer. We are thankful for the earth and um, the sun and the stars and the planets and the solar system and for all the grass and um, flowers and weeds and everything on the earth. Amen. We are thankful for the grass and all the animals and the wildlife that keeps us alive. Amen. I am thankful and mindful. I'm Mary Lou Weaver Maher, and this is my husband, Jim Maher. This morning we're reading a contemporary paraphrase from the book of Genesis, chapter 18, 1 through 15, and then chapter 21, verses 1 through 7. One blazing hot summer afternoon, Abraham was sitting at the entrance to his tent when the Lord appeared to him. Looking up, Abraham saw three strangers approaching him. He immediately jumped up and hurried to welcome them as honored guests. And he said, Please allow me the honor of sharing the hospitality of my home with you. Come in, take a bath, put your feet up for a bit. Let me serve you a meal so that you can leave refreshed and strengthened. I would count it as a favor to have the opportunity to serve you in this way. So they said, thank you, we accept. Abraham, hurried into the tent and said, Sarah, quick, bake up a batch of scones while I organize the barbie. Then he ran out to his grazing herd and butchered a prime calf. He instructed one of his workers to prepare the best cuts for the barbecue. 
When it was all ready, he served it up for his guests with a yogurt dip and plenty to drink, and he waited on them while they ate. During the meal, they said to him, where is your wife, Sarah? Abraham replied, she's inside in the tent. Then one of the three said, mark my words, I'll be back this way in about a year's time, and by then your wife, Sarah, will have a son. Sarah was in the tent behind them as they talked, and she overheard this, knowing well that she and Abraham were both elderly and that she had long since passed the time of having a child. She laughed to herself, saying, Fat chance. Am I going to have such pleasure at my age and with my husband past it too? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and question whether she could have a child at her age? Is there any good thing the Lord is incapable of doing? I'll be back this way again in a year's time, just as I said, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was shocked that she'd been caught and blurted out, I didn't mean to laugh. Yes, but you did, replied the Lord. The Lord was good to Sarah and followed through on the promise made to her. Sarah felt fell pregnant to Abraham and gave birth to a baby son. This happened when they were both old and gray. Abraham was already 100 years old when the child was born. Sarah gave birth to their son right at the time God had spoken about. Abraham named his son Isaac and circumcised him when he was eight days old because that is what God had told him to do. Sarah said, now God has given me something to laugh about and everyone who hears the news will laugh with me. Once no one would have dared raise the topic of me having a baby with Abraham, but now I have given birth to the old man's son. So I'm here just to introduce Mary Beth Bolin, our new youth and young adult uh, coordinator. And she's coming on staff with us and just started this week. And so she's gonna introduce herself, herself to you but I am so excited. I see so much potential in what she can offer the church. And I hope that you will welcome her with open arms and uh, make her feel right at home here in Atascadero. Okay, here's Mary Beth. Good morning, Atascadero UMC. I am Mary Beth Bowling, and I am so excited to be joining you as your new Youth and Young Adult Ministries Director. I met some of the youth just this last Wednesday at our Zoom gathering, and I'm really excited for another gathering this coming Wednesday at 7. I also look forward to meeting all of you at our Zoom coffee hour today after worship. I want to tell you a little bit about myself. I'm in the process of becoming a United Methodist minister. This is something that I've wanted to do ever since I was a child. My dad is a minister. Some of you know Richard Bolin. He and my mom, Kay, attended here for a year, the year after he retired, and we all live in Los Osos. I didn't go straight to seminary as a young adult. I took a long, winding path through many adventures, making music and art, and getting to know all sorts of different kinds of people and different kinds of spiritualities along the way. I got an MA from Claremont School of Theology, focusing on singing as a spiritual practice. And later, I headed back into the ministry as a Unitarian Universalist. But as I dug deeper into my calling, I discovered that my heart really belongs to the United Methodist Church and our unique spiritual path of being followers of Jesus. Young people, as your leader, I want to focus on helping you each become leaders, connected in your own unique way to that powerful energy that is God, so that together we can be powerful healers and justice makers in the world while having a lot of fun along the way. I love to think creatively and outside the box. So youth, let's put our minds together and reinvent what church looks like. There's no limit to the possibilities 
of what we can do together. A reading from the book of Romans, chapter 5, verses 1 through 8. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Thanks be to God for this holy word. I'm Chuck Mason, and I'll be reading from Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 to 38. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. I'm reading the prayer of intercession. Creator God, you call us to love and serve you with body, mind, and spirit through loving your creation and our sisters and brothers. Open our hearts in compassion and receive these petitions on behalf of the needs of the church and the world. This is our moment of silence for you to lift up prayers for loved ones, friends, and people in the church. Amen. Holy One, hear our prayers and make us faithful stewards of the fragile bounty on this earth so that we may be entrusted with the riches of heaven. We pray this in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from temptation and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. I am the church. You are the church. We are the church together. All who follow Jesus all around the world, yes, we're the church together. The church is not a building, the church is not a steeple, the church is not a resting place, the church is a people. I am the church, you are the church, we are the church together. All who follow Jesus all around the world, yes, we're the church together. 
We're many kinds of people with many kinds of faces, all colors and all ages too, from all times and places. I am the church, you are the church, we are the church together. All who follow Jesus all around the world, yes, we're the church together. Sometimes the church is marching, sometimes it's bravely burning, sometimes it's riding, sometimes hiding, always it's learning. I am the church, you are the church, we are the church together. All who follow Jesus all around the world, yes, we're the church together. And when we cannot gather, there's still singing and there's praying, there's still laughing and there's crying too, and all of it saying, I am the church, you are the church, we are the church together. All who follow Jesus all around the world, yes, we're the church together. At Pentecost, some people received the Holy Spirit and told the good news through the world to all who would hear it. I am the church, you are the church, we are the church together. All who follow Jesus all around the world, yes, we're the church together. Last Sunday, I participated in the peaceful protest organized in here in Atascadero for Black Lives Matter. The event took place down at the Sunken Gardens in town, and then we moved up the street to the police headquarters where we kneeled for eight minutes and 46 seconds in memory of George Floyd. As the group moved down the street, police and sheriff officers kept us safe from traffic. Now, I wasn't sure if I would go at first. I was concerned about the proper protocols, like uh, people keeping the proper distance or wearing masks. But I went over and went to see, and I could see that almost everyone was doing all they could to keep practicing these safety guidelines. I had plenty of room, I had my mask on, and I felt part of the event, even though I was properly socially distanced from everyone. It was good to, to be there, and I saw some of our mixed families there, as well as some of our church members, other pastors and their congregation members. And I felt in a way that I was representing all of those who might have wanted to be there, but stayed at home, not risking any exposure to COVID-19. Now I've gone to these kinds of events in the past and my intention was to join with others and be a part of the resistance to the injustice of the world. Now, as I kneeled for the eight minutes and 46 centers seconds, it felt like a, an excruciating long time. But I turned to prayer. And in that time, I prayed for George Floyd's family and the family of all of those who's lost loved ones through the violence. I prayed for our police officers and our first responders and all that they do in so many ways to keep us safe. I prayed for myself, that I might be open to the Spirit and how it's moving me to take action. I prayed for our congregation, that we might be a church where people are open, feel uh, accepted, and that we're open to them and that they find a home with us. Just like I hope in this time online that we are finding a place with one another. Shortly after the protest was done and I went back home, 
I received uh, an email from our conference, and it was talking about our bishops of the United Methodist Church calling us to pray, calling us to pray at 8.46 a.m. each day for 30 days for eight minutes and 46 seconds. We could pray, I think, in this time for the end of injustice, for the families who have lost loved ones, for the wisdom and imagination for us to build a better world, a world where all can live in peace all around the world. In the book, Resistance, written by John Cobb Jr., a professor at Claremont School of Theology, he talks about the Bible calling us to oppose the basic direction society is heading. The biblical message is that God's love, that God's, God loves all creatures and God calls all humans to show, show love, mercy, and justice to one another. Active resistance to the injustice is both in the world and in ourselves, he says, requires deep inward grounding in the biblical faith, a grounding that is rarely attained without the ongoing disciplines of prayer and reflection. So starting with eight minutes and 46 seconds of prayer each day, let us help one another develop a groundedness into the deep richness of God's word. Now the stories of Jesus and Paul and Abraham that were read to us today are important not just because they're in the Bible, but their stories and what they have taught us by their lives have vital impact for our lives today. So let's dive into the lessons we've heard read today. And by the way, since we're at home, we might take our Bibles off the shelves or the tables and read together these scriptures as we hear them on the, on the video together. And maybe take notes and circle words that really stu stood out to you. In today's reading about Abraham, I was struck with the verse, is there anything too difficult for the Lord? This is the beginning of our uh, reflecting on Abraham's story. We'll continue this focus for a few more weeks now into the summer months. Let's begin today's reflection on reminding ourselves that Abraham was quite old when he was called by God to enter into a new covenant to believe. Believe in what, you might ask? Well, that call came a little bit earlier than our scripture lesson today, but earlier in Genesis it says, God says he will make you a maker of a great nation, and I will bless you, and I'll make your name great, and you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you and curse them that curses you, and all the families of the earth shall bless themselves by you. This call is, as I said, a little bit earlier in Genesis, but it reminds us of a God that is a universal God, one who cares for all the families of the earth. And we are connected to one another through this God who has created us all and the spirit of God who unites us still together. Abraham is asked to do two things to fulfill his side of the contract. Bruce Feeler in his book, Abraham, talks about uh, the journey of Abraham is the journey of, to the heart of three faiths. And so he talks about these two ways that Abraham responds. First, he must leave his native land and his father's house. Now, this is an extraordinary uh, event for any of us, but even more profound by how old Abraham is that his wife is barren, and Abraham doesn't know where he is going. Secondly, Abraham has no burning bush, no dead frogs, no tablets, no water sprouting from some rock. The voice does not even identify himself. And you notice in our story today, the three men are not even identified as God. 
But God, Abraham trusts and believes that this message is important and heaven sent. So he takes a leap of faith and does all he, do, he needs to do to move to, into a strange land. Now in our country's history, many are saying the old ways have to give way to the new. The old prejudices and actions and laws that enforce inequality have to be replaced with those structures and laws that will provide for all God's children. The myth of looking out for number one and accumulating all the wealth you can for as long as you can needs to be replaced with a vision of a world where we all have equal opportunity, where no one goes hungry, and where all are healed. I read that story of how Jesus went around to all the cities and villages to heal all, and I wonder, can we find a way to follow Jesus' example, to go across all the communities and cities of our great world, provide everyone access to health care and to those preventative practices that will help us stay healthy, live longer, and help communities live in peace. This time of COVID-19 has acquainted us with the reality that as we have to think globally about health, not about our own community only, but places as far away as China and Africa. But we have to learn how to offer the healing services right here in the United States. We have to learn how to eliminate the barriers. There's, so there's uh, an equal place for everyone at the table of health. We know and read the statistics that a larger percentage of people who are dying are minorities. So we need to take action to write our legislators to work for equal access to health care for all, demand it of our leaders. We need to take action voting and volunteering and to bring about changes that are needed so all God's children are, called, are taken care of, not just those who have the power or the cash. We need to follow Jesus' examples and go into the world and find ways of healing all of those who suffer. There is nothing too difficult for the Lord. And so as long as we're willing to follow the call to be one of the workers for the harvest, we will be inspired and we will be led to do what is needed. It doesn't matter how old or how young we are. Jesus needs workers of all ages, all sizes and shapes, of all backgrounds and economic status to join together. When I was kneeling at the protest here in Atascadero, I felt a deep connection to all everywhere, who are yearning for those, for changes to happen in our world. I could not even speak about it because the power was so strong. And once I stood up, not sure where this moment would take me, I decided I wanted to be like Abraham and to prepare to leave the comfortable, the security of what I'm used to and strike out to a new place in my life, trusting fully in God to lead me. Some might laugh at the protesters. They may not understand the power of God and the power of all people to bring change to the world. Some might underestimate how God can use them for change. But that's because they have forgotten that the Bible is a story of making the impossible possible. Can we all make the promise to pray daily for the people of the world? Can we all make the promise to take action in whatever ways we are inspired to, to bring justice for all? Paul writes that we have 
all have access to faith through grace, a grace that blankets the world every single day. And as we all access that faith, we will find the strength to stand up to those who perpetrate injustice. As we access that faith, we will find it does not matter how old or how young we are called to be workers for justice. As we access that faith, we find we can imagine a world that is free from injustice and violence. And imagine what our role is in that. As we access that faith, we will find ourselves taking a journey from where we have been to a strange new place where God will meet us and show us great things. The key is to begin where Abraham begins, welcoming the stranger, showing hospitality, and finding our lives will never be the same as a result of this encounter. Let us then welcome God let us welcome all God's children. Let us welcome prayer and joy and hope as we love one another, as Jesus calls us and teaches us. Amen. We want to offer you this moment to give of your tithes and offering. There is a link to our online giving in the comments, and you are always invited to send a check to the church. Thank you for giving so faithfully so we can continue to offer God's word to our virtual congregation. Lord, we know that there is much work to be done, far more than we ever imagined. We ask that you bless these gifts, that they be used for the work you have set before us, for we place our lives and trust in you. Amen.
Now let us receive the benediction. The Lord seeks willing, willing laborers for the harvest. Therefore go out into the world, proclaim the good news of the nearness of God, and call all who hear to wholeness, to life, to holiness. And may God pour love into your hearts. May Christ Jesus open the way of grace to you. And may the Holy Spirit work through all things to build up you in endurance, character, and hope. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, amen. Yeah.